Hello and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar Minimal Invasive Surgery and Periodontal Regeneration, an ideal combination. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Pier Paolo Cortellini, whose aim during this presentation will be to focus on the adjunctive benefit of using a surgical microscope, the use of microsurgical instruments and the application of minimally invasive surgical techniques. Dr. Cortellini received his MD from the University of Florence, Italy, in in 1980 and his DDS in 1984 from the University of Siena, Italy. He is active member and past president of the Italian Society of Periodontology, active member and past president of the European Federation of Periodontology. Dr. Cortellini lectures extensively on a national and international level. He is referee of the main scientific journals in the field of periodontology and is the author of more than 100 original publications in scientific journals. We would like to thank Dr. Cortellini for being with us today and by for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture as they will be addressed by Dr. Cortellini at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Dr. Cortellini. Good evening, good evening uh, everybody. Thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for inviting me to this podium. I <coughs> will share with you uh, a little bit of our time uh, the evening before dinner. Um, I am talking uh, to you from my city. I live in uh, Florence. Here you see a, an overview of Firenze. Actually, this is a picture that I have taken from uh, the window of my bedroom. So I enjoy a very nice overview of my city. I live on the hills and I bike down to my practice every day. As you understand, I am uh, a private practitioner. I have a private practice in Florence. Uh, this is one uh, of my uh, activities, taking one third of my time. Uh, another third uh, it is taken by research in uh, periodontal and implant therapy through a private uh, non-profit academy, Ergo Perio, based in Switzerland, that I run along with uh, my mates, uh, Maurizio Tonetti, Klaus Lang, and uh, Mariano Sanz. In uh, my practice treating uh, patients, I see their needs. They try to give answers to those needs through research. And uh, when I have uh, an answer, I try to apply what I have learned to my patients. And uh, when I'm really very sure that everything works, then I come to you with my educational uh, facility, it's called the uh, Tangra Modis. This is run uh, along with my mate, uh, Maurizio Tonetti. And here, we try to uh, share with our colleagues what we have learned through research and private practice. This is my golden triangle. Let us to start the topic of today. We are talking about uh, uh, periodontal regeneration and especially uh, focusing on uh, uh, few of uh, the different uh, possibilities to regenerate uh, periodontal attachment around the teeth. We will be focusing on uh, uh, minimal invasive surgical techniques and uh, the advantages of uh, using uh, uh, microsurgery and the microsurgical instruments. We'll be uh, narrowing down our, present our presentation to uh, intrabony defects. You know that uh, in the area of intrabony defects, uh, periodontal regeneration has a tremendous amount uh, of uh, scientific background. There is an impressive predictability, and uh, basically today we can uh, treat any one wall, two wall, three-wall 
combination wall in pro bono defense. From very deep, very shallow, from very wide to very narrow. Why are we interested in uh, treating intraboni defects? Because uh, intraboni defects are associated with uh, deep pockets. And uh, uh, the rationale for treatment is uh, very clear to everybody. Residual pockets uh, constitute a very high risk for disease recurrences and progression. The intraboni defects per se are a risk for disease recurrence and progression. Why do we apply periodontal regeneration? We said to reduce pockets. But of course, we can reduce pockets in many different uh, uh, ways. Here, we want to favor a way that is uh, uh, through attachment uh, and bone gain, possibly minimizing uh, gingival recession. Here we are on the anterior case with a very severe anterior lesion, one wall defect, with uh, a severe bone deficiency and a defect close to the apex. Here we applied periodontal regeneration, rebuilding completely the lost uh, periodontal tissues around the lateral incisor. And we've been able to uh, grow up bone very close to the CJ stabilizing the position of the gingival margin uh, through years. This papilla is still here because we have uh, a bone support underneath. This is uh, how to change the prognosis of compromised teeth in aesthetic areas. Same can be done on the posteriors. It's a very severe defect uh, distal to the lo first uh, lower right molar. Here we applied, again, periodontal regeneration rebuilding uh, completely uh, bone uh, very close to the CJ. In the meantime, we have extracted the wisdom tooth. And the uh, extraction of the wisdom tooth lasted with a very severe lesion close to the apex of the second molar. Applied periodontal regeneration also there, getting out uh, with uh, uh, a very nice buildup of bone also distal to the second molar. Bone has been uh, growing back and maturing through years uh, for three, four years after completion of regeneration. This is very clear cut message. Regeneration does not end up after a year. After a year, you have stability. You have the bone back. You have the pocket closed. But if the patient is under maintenance, you will get uh, uh, improvement of your outcomes through time. This is how to change the prognosis of compromised teeth in the posterior area. This is a typical example of an abutment severely compromised. And uh, also, this abutment was uh, treated with periodontal regeneration, completely built up. And you see how the periodontium has been uh, completely built up, rebuilt around the cuspid. And now the cuspid for 12 years has been and still is uh, uh, the anterior abutment of a four-unit bridge with the first molar. Again, this is how to change the prognosis of compromised teeth uh, in uh, the modality of abutments. How do we do so? Well, we need, uh, first of all, a biological principle. And today, we uh, are left with uh, the potential use of bone grafts or bone substitutes to uh, help regeneration to occur barrier membranes, uh, pushers, let me say, amelogenins and growth factors, and combination of uh, uh, the, uh, the ones we have mentioned. So we can combine several of those, barriers and grafts, amelogenins and grafts, and so on. We have uh, a lot of histology proving that uh, these uh, methods so far uh, do really uh, get out with the true periodontal regeneration, new bound, new root cement and uh, uh, periodontal ligament connecting bone and root cement. Um, what is important, however, is to have a look to the efficacy of uh, these methods. Here I'm showing to you uh, five meta-analyses. And uh, these are proofs of efficacy of each of, these, uh, of the uh, methodologies that we are discussing now. 
uh, what I'm showing to you is uh, the additional effect of uh, the regenerative materials on top of flap alone. You know that uh, to prove efficacy, we need uh, to compare flap alone against the flap plus the material. So when the material is giving more advantage on top of flap alone, this is uh, what gets out. For example, with the FDBA, we have a clinical uh, improvement on top of flap alone of 0.4 millimeter. It's very little and statistically not significant. With barriers, we have uh, much more. We get much more. Uh, 1.71. This is a lot on average and uh, is highly significant from a statistical standpoint. With amelogenin, we have uh, a very similar outcome, 1.72, highly significant. We have uh, still an advantage with the combination therapy. Here is a combination of uh, uh, collagen barrier and uh, deproteinized bovine bone mineral. And uh, still, uh, we have uh, a very little advantage in uh, placing growth factors on top of uh, flap alone. Uh, you cannot compare, really, through the different materials. But uh, let me say that here you have a picture. And uh, you can get out with your personal opinion on uh, the approaches that show best efficacy. Um, let us to have a look to development of flap design, because when we apply periodontal regeneration, it's very clear that we do it under a flap. The flaps are not the same uh, through history. We started several years ago with the modified Wiedemann flap. This is what we started with in uh, periodontal regeneration in the 70s and beginning of the 80s. Then uh, uh, Rita Kay, a very brilliant, uh, U.S. guy uh, understood the goodness of uh, preserving uh, the interdental soft tissue uh, to protect the area to be regenerated. And he proposed that this papilla preservation technique. With my group, we uh, modified these original techniques, proposing the modified and the simplified papilla preservation flap in the 90s, and uh, came in uh, with uh, improvements of those techniques through the use of a microscope. Uh, microsurgical uh, approach using uh, an operative microscope and microsurgical instruments in, at the beginning uh, of the year 2000. And uh, through the use of a microscope, we've been able to uh, reduce uh, the invasivity of what uh, we are applying on our patients, proposing minimally invasive surgical techniques, and more recently, a modified minimally invasive surgical techniques. We'll be discussing these approaches in uh, more details. Today, we are left with these approaches. In my, uh, my approach, in the approach of my team, in my practice, I do apply to my patients the papilla preservation technique and the minimally invasive surgical approaches. You know, it's uh, important to understand that uh, the different uh, flaps that we have been so far reminding have uh, different performances. Here I'm showing to you the performances of the different flaps alone without uh, the use, uh, the introduction of uh, uh, regenerative materials. So what you will see here is the amount of clinical attachment level that we can, gain, we can gain in an intrabony component by applying different types of flaps. Let us to start with the Wittmann flap. On average, we expect to gain about 1.6 millimeters uh, applying a Wittmann flap on top of uh, uh, an intrabony defect. If we apply a papilla preservation flap, our gain in attachment on average will uh, increase to 2.5 millimeters. If we apply a minimally invasive surgical technique, we'll increase uh, up to close to 3 millimeters. If we apply a modified mist, our potential increases enormously to more than four. And uh, on top of these outcomes, we have to uh, really place the additional benefit of the regenerative material on top of these. How does it work through time? This is our improvements through time. This is my personal improvements 
through the years, starting from the, uh, the end of the 80s, when I declared in my first papers about a little less than 4 millimeters of clinical attachment to lung cancer. Through time, I, I have been able to increase enormously my ability to gain attachment in my cases. A big jump was here. Look, in this area was a big jump when I applied, started applying the papilla preservation flaps. Then I did another big jump here when I started to apply uh, microsurgical techniques. Uh, up to, you see here, close to 8 millimeters of clinical attachment level gains in the last times. Now, this is not uh, the only advantage I have uh, achieved uh, through improvements. Uh, I've been also able to reduce the enormously the amount of gingival recession that I caused to my patient by applying regeneration. Started by uh, publishing a little less than two millimeters of gingival recession at the beginning of my training, in the beginning of the 90s, dropping down to a fraction of millimeters in the recent time. Today, we are able really to gain a lot and keep the gingiva very stable. How regeneration occurs? These are the three key principles that we have to discuss at the beginning to understand how regeneration occurs. We need uh, three key principles, site protection, space, and blood clot stability. What the site protection means, this is what I did, personally I did, at the beginning of the 80s, leaving biomaterials completely exposed, and uh, the biomaterials got infected and contaminated. With the uh, flap failure, this is a clear flap failure, uh, we have a lot of contamination and regeneration does not work. Today, we do it very differently. We try to preserve the soft tissues, the interdental soft tissues, and we try to protect primary intention, the biomaterials. Flap integrity and protection uh, really grants to you a very protected environment for regeneration. Without protection, regeneration fails. Second uh, big issue is space. Whenever uh, we want uh, to provide regeneration, we have to provide the space for it. We have to provide the space for regeneration to occur. We have to provide space for the blood clot to form. If we apply a flap on top of a root surface and we release the flap and leave the flap collapse onto the root surface, this collapse of the flap will prevent regeneration to occur. The bone will not grow up because there will be no space. This is why, in some instances, we are obliged to place barriers or biomaterials to keep the flap apart. Here you see the biomaterial keeping the flap apart and uh, just uh, expanding the space uh, for regeneration to occur. But be careful. If we apply in an improper way the biomaterial and the biomaterial collapse on top of the root surface, the biomaterials, the biomaterials themselves will be preventing the bone to grow up because they will be keeping the space. Without space, regeneration. The third a very important issue is blood clot stability. This is a very modern way to look at the periodontal regeneration. At the end uh, of our debridement, we get uh, a clean root surface and the bone exposed. The blood will flow in. The, the blood uh, will be uh, contained into a defect. If you have a defect with uh, three walls, uh, the stability of the clot will be perfect. If you have a defect with the one wall, the stability of the clot will be very little. Then on top of the uh, clot, you will uh, close the flap. The flap uh, will uh, get uh, links with the, the clot, so will interact with the clot uh, in a very high way. And if uh, the flap uh, has uh, some sort of mobility, the mobility of the flap will be transferred to the clot. And this will give uh, instability to the clot. Uh, third issue, uh, tooth uh, mobility. If you have uh, a, very a very containing defect, let, let us to say three walls, and you have a very stable flap, so a condition in which a blood clot is very stable and your, uh, your tooth is mobile, then all the system is unstable. 
And you know what happens when, uh, for one or the three reasons we are discussing, the clot is unstable, the clot will uh, detach from the root surface. This is the weakest part of uh, the connection of the clot with the, soft, with the tissues. And uh, after the detachment of the blood clot from the root surface, the long junction epithelium will grow down uh, and regeneration will fail. Without blood clot stability, regeneration fails. So let us to have a look uh, to these issues and uh, transfer it into our daily practice. Uh, we make the two ex extreme examples. When we are in front of a wide one wall defense, then we have very difficult these give uh, limited support and limited stability to our system. And the regeneration will occur, but will be very difficult to uh, let it occur. On the other end of our scale, there will be narrow three-wall defects. These are the fantastic ones, the very easy ones. They will provide very good support to the soft tissues and uh, very high standard, uh, good stability to the clone. Here, regeneration is very easy. Let's uh, have a look uh, to some cases uh, treated with the different flap approaches that we have been discussing in the beginning. This is what I did in uh, the beginning of the 80s. You see as a case of 1983. Here I applied what I knew in that time, the very beginning of uh, regeneration, a very rough uh, flap with uh, the biomaterial exposed. This is the case after 30 years. You see, we have been able to regrow an enormous amount of bone in this very deep defect on the lateral incisor. Here you see the apex, not there. But uh, I am not satisfied by aesthetics. Why gingiva retracted so much? Well, because uh, with this axis flap, the modified Widman flap that we applied in those times, we were basically unable to close primary intention our flaps on top of the biomaterials. So please, please, Forget it. Never use a modified Wiedemann flap to provide regeneration. We changed everything by proposing the modified and the simplified uh, papilla preservation technique that uh, uh, was uh, meant to preserve the interdental papilla and provide the primary intention closure and coverage on top of the biomaterial. You see a case with the barrier underneath after five weeks. Full protection. And uh, this is the case after 21 years. Here the story is completely different. Look at the papilla that has been growing back in a better condition than a baseline and uh, supported by a uh, good bone that was regrown under the soft tissue. Uh, with the papilla preservation flaps, uh, we have been able to improve enormously our performance in terms of potential of providing primary closure of the flaps on top of uh, the biomaterial. You see about 70% of our cases were completely closed and stayed closed for at least six weeks, so, so through a healing period. But let us to look it uh, in another direction. This means that uh, this is much better than zero, of course, but about 30% of our cases failed in terms of primary closure. So this is why we went uh, through uh, microsurgery. And uh, we applied uh, uh, the same approaches, the same approach you have seen uh, up to now through a microscope and using microsurgical instruments. This is a case after 13 years. Again, very nice integrity of the soft tissues and uh, uh, the grow up uh, in this uh, very severe defect. From a performance uh, uh, standpoint, we have been able to increase enormously, again, our performance in, of achieving primary closure, full primary closure with this approach. You see, 92.3% of our cases were completely closed. So we, have, we had the failure in a little less than 8% of our cases. Uh, then we came in with the modified, uh, with the minimal invasive surgical technique. Uh, the minimum invasive surgical technique uh, means uh, uh, nothing and all. Uh, the overall idea of it is to uh, rise up minimal flaps. This is a case treated in that way, a very severe one. You see the defect to the apex here, and after nine years, the 
defect completely resolved. So this was treated with pure endogame. Um, and with the MIST, our per, uh, surgical performance increased to 95%. So only 5% of the cases failed surgery. Uh, what is the overall idea? Let us to go into the details of minimally invasive surgical technique. Is the philosophy is uh, 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 what we do is to approach the interdental papilla with uh, an horizontal or a diagonal incision, and uh, in, uh, with this incision we open up the papilla from the buccal side. Then we elevate the papilla to the lingual side, elevating a full thickness lingual flap. Look here the. Uh, buccal flap is very, uh, very small, very tiny, ends up uh, uh, in uh, the papilla. It's really limited to the papilla associated to the defect. As soon as we see and uncover the bone, the crestal bone, we stop rising the flap. It's completely unnecessary to open up this papilla and to open up distant to the mouth. This is uh, what I would have done by applying uh, the papilla preservation. On the lingual side, I've been uh, uh, opening a little more, a little more ample. You see it from top, and it's a little, uh, you don't have the idea of the extension here, but here you have a, a dehiscence on the lingual side. So to get an access on the lingual side, we extend and a little bit on this side, the flap. A single suture is a modified uh, uh, internal matrix suture uh, is enough to close the flap. This is after seven years and the complete resolution of the interbony component. So the overall idea of this minimally invasive surgical technique is to increase stability of the blood flow. Why so? Because we are uh, providing uh, very stable flaps. The flaps are full thickness. Mucogingival junction is not interested. There is no release of the periosteum, and is very small. Uh, by doing so, also, we reduce short time, invasivity, and patient mobility. Most of these patients do not feel any pain. Let us to have a look uh, to a very severe case treated in this way. And here you, you will see the possibility of approaching a multiple, uh, multiple defects and multiple teeth. We are approaching now these two very se severely compromised uh, uh, lower bicuspids. These are pockets, and you add in uh, about uh, five millimeters of gingival recession. So we have. Clinical attachment level loss of about 15 millimeters on the second lower bicuspid. Uh, we have a look to a short clip, so you can see uh, how we cut uh, on top of the papilla. This is uh, an horizontal cut, the interdental space is rather wide. We do another horizontal cut between the first the bicuspid and the cuspid, rise up uh, a tiny buccal flap. You see, we have uh, very little gingiva. Actually, we have most alveolar mucosa. We don't mind it. Rising the lingual flap uh, to bone, cleaning, taking away all the granulation tissue. And uh, you see the severity of the defects. It's very it's a huge defect. Look at the mobility, the mobility of the second bicuspid. What uh, would you do there? Here we are applying uh, EDTA, washing and drying. Applying uh, a first uh, suture to stabilize the flap. And uh, with the first uh, suture in place, uh, this is a, actually a modified internal mattress suture. We are applying uh, endogain here on the distal and uh, the medial of the second and also the first uh, bicuspid, completing our suturing approach with uh, more sutures and uh, ending in uh, also thinner sutures to stabilize uh, at best our flap. This is, uh, uh, you know, how to close up uh, primary intention. You understand how important it is to grant the primary protection to the um, healing environment. Here what we did. This is the end of our surgery. Of course, you cannot leave uh, uh, such a mobility on a tooth. We have expressed before the, the tremendous impact of mobility on flood stability. Here we have a very nice uh, three wall, a very nice uh, three wall. We have a very stable flap, and we have a very mobile teeth. So we are splinting. Immediately after surgery, we splint both and with the cuspid. After the splint, uh, we get a very good stability. This is after one week. And you see the primary closure maintained through time. 
this is the case after one year. Look at the tremendous amount of bone that has been regrowing in a year around the two bicuspid, and here you have uh, the comparison uh, before and after. This tooth has been desplinted a couple of months ago, and now uh, both the teeth are working uh, as uh, independent units in, in the mouth of these patients. Um, let us to switch uh, to the modified mist. The modified mist is a, even a more uh, conservative approach. In the modified mist, uh, we open up uh, the buccal, small buccal triangular flap, and uh, we leave the papilla and the interdental papilla in place. We do not rise up the lingual flap. This is a case uh, treated in 2007, and this is the case after seven years. This was the defect, this is what uh, uh, we got out and the, the gingival margin and the interdental papilla that uh, maintained the full integrity. With uh, the mist uh, and the modified mist, uh, uh, look here, the modified mist, uh, uh, our ability to keep all the flap closed uh, increased uh, close to 98%. We still have a, a mere 2% of uh, small failures around our Papilla, but most are completely closed. And this is uh, what you need to get a very good healing. Is uh, this modified mist an ideal clinical model? I, I, I think so. I think it's uh, quite a brilliant model. I, I will show to you why. Uh, this is uh, uh, the opening, the very small window, the very small buccal triangle window that we open up to get access to the defect. You see the papilla in place. And the lingual flap is not uh, uh, is not elevated at all. So is uh, our horizontal incision on the buccal side, and uh, this uh, sh very short full thickness uh, flap elevation gives us the access to the defect. Fro through the window here, we carve away literally we dissect and carve away the granulation tissue from under the papilla. The defect debridement uh, is not easy. You need a microscope. Here you need a microscope. You can do it also with loops, the good illumination. But with a microscope, you see really well in the window. Let us to go back to our model and have a look to what happens. Here we have uh, the debrided root surface, uh, the bone that is being cleared by the granulation tissue, and on top of it, the papilla in place. This has not been elevated. The lingual flap has not been elevated. Now, our uh, blood clot will form in a very stable and uh, very protected uh, small room. The only access to the room will be this back of flap. Imagine the stability. Here we have a roof. The papilla will not collapse, preserving space. You remember the relevant space? Here we are providing space by keeping the papilla in a place. If you are missing a palatal bony wall, there will be uh, our palatal flap that, that will be supplementing the palatal bony wall missing in case. And uh, when we close the buccal bone, the buccal flap window, the small window from the buccal side with a tiny and very simple uh, modified matrix suture, all the system is extreme, extremely protected. So the overall idea here is to provide a stable gingival walls to supplement the missing bony walls and a stable roof on top of the blood clot to maintain space, to maintain space to the, to the clot to form and to increase blood clot stability. Let us have a look to this case. I will show to you a small clip to see how to do it. This is a very deep defect. So I'm showing to you a difficult case, not an easy case. The uh, interdental cut on the buccal side, horizontal cut, uh, we extend the buccal incision to the lateral incisor and to the cuspid without invading the neighboring papilla. Rise up a very tiny and delicate buccal window and the two bone. When the bone is uh, visible, we stop it. Then we debride and take away the granulation tissue. Here we are cleaning around the corner, as you see. You see it's a very deep defect with uh, a consistent portion of the buccal bony wall that is missing. Very difficult. The clot is uh, uh, filling in. This is a clip. It's been cut. Uh, it took about six minutes here for the clot, for the blood to fill in all the space. 
And imagine the stability here of this system when we close the back of Windows. Um, this is uh, the, the blood that is clotting now, is forming the clots. Now we apply the suture. And this will be follow the suturing ap uh, application from buckle. It's an internal mattress modified to the uh, base of the interdental papilla. This is difficult. You have to be very central, very precise. Hit the papilla in the center, deep, from buckle to lingual. You see the needle getting out from the lingual side and uh, then come back from the tip of the papilla this is dangerous you have to be very careful here uh, hit bite the uh, buccal side another time then go back to the lingual loop we catch the lingual loop shorten it and we are ready to close uh, we close with the three uh, typical knots that we have to apply to this uh, very nice suture. This is uh, a gore that allows us to refine in the best way the uh, tension of the suture on top of the wounds. It's a primary intention closure, and uh, we uh, just deliver the patient for uh, the healing. This was baseline. This is after a week. L look the integrity of the wound, the perfection of uh, the healing, and uh, this is after five months. This is after 18 months. After 18 months, we have a 3 millimeter sulcus, radiograph, baseline, 5 months, 18 months. The defect is almost completely resolved. It has to go further. This is after 3 years. You see further grow of bone. Now it's flat, completely, completely uh, regrown. This is after uh, 4 years, the last shot of this case. Look also the papilla that has been growing up, uh, compare baseline and three years. Hey, guys, uh, if you uh, remind, well, this case was treated with the flap alone. Here, no regenerative material was inserted. This is a pure healing of uh, the area with uh, its uh, autologous potential. As I told you, the, in, uh, at some time, showing the potential of the different uh, flap approaches, we saw how this flap has an incredible potential for uh, bone regrowth and the clinical attachment level. I'm not anticipating true regeneration under here because I did not, I did not add in any regenerative material, but it's a fantastic clinical uh, healing. It has to see another case in the posterior. This is a posterior area with a very severe defect on the uh, lower, uh, first lower uh, right, uh, left molar. Is a nine millimeter pocket. Again, I show to you a small clip. Uh, you see the possibility uh, of application of uh, these technicals in the posterior area. Again, with a microscope and microsurgical instrument. You see a microblade again. This is a microblade. You cannot do this with a big blade. You need a microblade. We are cutting in the sulcus, opening up with a, a very small periosteal elevator, looking for bone. Here we are dissecting the gingiva to catch the bone. As soon as we, as we cut through the connective tissue and we hit the bone, we stop cutting. Here we are dissecting, literally dissecting away the granulation tissue from under the papilla. We are separating, in other words, the papillary tissue that will remain in place from the tissue that will be removed with the instrumentation. The instrumentation is very careful always a combination of hand and mechanical instruments to clear the defect perfectly. Here we have a three wall. It's a pure three wall. In this case, we've been using uh, endogen. This is uh, uh, EDTA to detoxify the root surface before placing uh, the uh, general material. I am uh, positioning a suture. Again, you see the internal mattress modified from buccal to lingual face of the papilla, then again back from the top of the papilla to buckle, and uh, hit uh, and bite uh, the buckle flap again, go back to the lingual loop. The suture has to, be, has to be positioned very balanced, very in the middle of the papilla, to avoid the suture to uh, just uh, get into the sulcus eh, or into the pocket. When uh, the suture is in place, we wash and dry, 
we apply MD again, and when the EMD is in, we are ready to close. Now we'll uh, uh, lock the place, the wound uh, with uh, our knots, uh, three knots, so one uh, and, uh, contrary to the previous one, three single knots. Clockwise, counterclock, and uh, clockwise again. This is primary closure in the area, this is baseline, and uh, after six years. Again, look, it's a perfect healing. Uh, the bone is back, uh, has been uh, healing, has been uh, filling in completely the bony defect. Look, the papilla, the papilla is uh, completely uh, similar to the uh, baseline one. We have not uh, got any gingival recession in the area. I showed to you the potential of this uh, approach through uh, by showing the uh, data, the outcomes of uh, our controlled uh, clinical trial. We did uh, a controlled clinical trial on 45 patients uh, with a defect each. Uh, we did a randomized double-blind uh, clinical trial with uh, three treatment groups. The first group was treated with the modified mistelone without any regenerative material. Here we have a case treated in that way. And again, look here, a complete resolution of the defect with the flap alone. This was the flap alone without any regenerative material. The second group was treated with the modified mist and the amelogenin. And this is a nice case treated with this way. And again, you see a very nice resolution of the intrabony component uh, with uh, this uh, approach. The third group was treated with uh, endogain and uh, uh, deproteinized uh, bo bovine bone mineral, and uh, this is a, so a combination therapy. Uh, this is a, a nice case treated in that way. You see one week and one year with the radiograph showing the biomaterial in place, but the nice resolution of the case. Outcomes, one year. Uh, <coughs> this is the group treated with the modified mist alone without any uh, regenerative material. Here you have the position of the gingival margin at baseline, and this is the intrabony component at baseline, 5.2 millimeters. This is a clinical attachment level gain of uh, the flap alone, modified mist alone, 4.1, and a very, very minimal uh, fraction of millimeters of gingival recession. This is uh, the uh, group treated with uh, uh, the uh, EMD, same uh, intrabony component, same uh, clinical attachment level gain, same uh, gingival retraction. This is the group treated with combination therapy, same intrabony component, same clinical attachment level gain, same uh, gingival retraction. No differences. So there are no clinical differences uh, among these three groups. We did more. We measured on uh, radiographs and bone gain. Here we have uh, measured 3.5 millimeters of bone gain, radiographic bone gain with the modified mist alone, same with modified mist and EMD, same with combination therapy. No differences. Uh, look, uh, this outcome, here is our study, they have shown to you on bars, has been confirmed by two other independent studies. The group of uh, Leonardo Trombelli, with a similar approach, combined uh, uh, this uh, uh, buckle flap alone against the buckle flap plus uh, a filler and a barrier. And there was no statistically significant difference, no difference uh, between the two groups. And the group of Mishra is an Indian group applying our modified mist uh, alone or versus uh, um, the application of uh, uh, growth factors. Also, they did not find any difference uh, between the two groups. So we have three independent studies showing uh, this tremendous potential of this approach. Um, this modified mist, mist apparently allows primary closures in uh, a relevant number of cases and uh, probably increases a lot blood clot stability and maintains space. Um, look, let us to jump a little bit more. We are little bit to the end of my presentation, but I want to show to you how much we can uh, rely on the potential for regeneration. The question is, can we push it harder? What do you do here? Um, this is a vital tooth, and uh, here we have the distal root completely 
with periodontium completely destroyed, 360 degrees all around and beyond the apex. The distal side of the mesial root is completely gone to the apex, and we have a through and through furcation. There is no mobility of this tooth. This is very important. You see the uh, clinical image, and uh, you can imagine the severity of this case. Uh, you can believe this or not, but this has been treated with the modified mist. The lingual flap has not been elevated. The papilla, you don't see the papilla here, but the papilla is still in place. They've been able, with a lot of uh, efforts, to clear the root and clean the root all around without elevating the lingual flap. Then uh, I placed the uh, endogain here, no biomaterials, and this is after five years. Um, this is a tremendous amount of regeneration, grow up of uh, bone and periodontium. The furcation is now a mere degree one, one millimeter of penetration here. And uh, look at the soft tissue conditions. Is uh, uh, an isolated case now. We have so far published uh, uh, a study, 2011. This, this um, uh, randomized clinical trial was priced, but was uh, acknowledged by the American Academy of Periodontology as uh, the best paper of uh, the last years terms of uh, uh, really uh, new achievements uh, in periodontal therapy. What you have done here? I have taken 50 patients with uh, an hopeless tooth each. So one of each of uh, these patients had, had a tooth to be extracted. Uh, 25 of these teeth uh, selected randomly have been regenerated with different approaches. 25 have been extracted. Then replaced with uh, uh, a regular bridge on teeth. One was not replaced. The patient was happy without the teeth. And 14 replaced with implants. I'm talking these uh, teeth here. Uh, look, most of these teeth are completely gone without periodontium. You have a small fragment here of bone, or here, a small fragment here. We are talking uh, uh, 16 millimeters. Uh, uh, radiographic bone loss. We are talking uh, 1.1 and 1.7 millimeters of uh, radiographic bone loss uh, beyond the apex. What we, we have been able to achieve from this group, we had the 25 hopeless teeth at baseline in the test group, I mean. 23 out of 25 uh, were completely uh, rebuilt. And uh, the prognosis of those teeth uh, was changed from hopeless to favorable. Favorable means uh, with enough bone to work in the mouth, be uh, working teeth, and with very shallow uh, sulci, regular sulci, no pockets. Two teeth did not achieve uh, the desirable prognosis and uh, have been extracted. So at one year, I have extracted two out of 25 hopeless teeth. 23 remain in the mouth. And uh, uh, as you can see up here, the clinical attachment level gain has been enormous. I uh, gained uh, almost 8 millimeters of clinical attachment uh, around these teeth. This is not unexpected uh, because the clinical attachment loss was enormous. After five years, uh, we have a complete stability of the clinical attachment. And uh, we have a complete stability of the teeth. In other words, the 23 teeth are still in the mouth, still working, still in function. I showed to you preliminary data. These are not published yet after 10 years. We have fantastic stability of uh, the clinical attachment around the teeth. But we lost a tooth. We lost a tooth, uh, unfortunately, for a trauma. And uh, was a central incisor. It was weak. It was not a very strong tooth that was still in the mouth. Uh, after nine years, was lost for a trauma. So actually, we have 22 out of 25 hopeless teeth still in the mouth. Survival rate uh, was 92% at five years, is uh, still 88% after eight years. So the potential is incredible. I am not telling uh, all of you to save those teeth, but I'm just uh, uh, showing this uh, for a reason. Look, the potential is uh, incredibly high, much bigger than you would ever think. Show to you a few cases just to have uh, an idea. Look here. This is uh, an extremely severe case with uh, uh, bone loss, uh, 
beyond the apex on both these abutments. These were both treated with periodontal regeneration look after five years. Yet the mobility was enormous, was uh, a degree five, if you have a degree five, was uh, more than three, I don't know. Was uh, moving one centimeter buccal and palatal, really like uh, a belt. Now the patient is uh, biting and chewing on the, these uh, two teeth, these two abutments normally. Um, this is another very severe condition on the a lower more. You have seen a lower more before. Showed to you that in the lower uh, jaw we can uh, do a lot. Look here, five years. Um, back to uh, function. Another one on the right. Uh, through and through bifurcation, this root was completely out of bound. One year, look. Almost complete uh, refill of bone. And look after five, six years. Look here. Look how much the bone grew back, maturing and continuing uh, to uh, fill in the uh, uh, interdental space and also the furcation. Look also the gingival margin. The recession that you had at baseline is still there, but there was no increase. It was a, was a very severe case. Uh, this was vital. The uh, tooth that you have seen previously was also vital. Why uh, devitalize these teeth? This is very clear. We have to instrument the apex of the root. When we, when we are obliged to instrument the apex, we have to uh, do endotherapy before applying uh, periodontal regeneration. Otherwise, we get necrosis. Um, I showed to you a very severe central incisor. Um, look here. This, is, this was necrotic, by the way. So there was a necrosis of this tooth. So it was uh, previously endodontically treated. We waited about uh, three months after uh, the endotherapy. After that time, we got in. And you see the periodontium was completely destroyed all around beyond the apex. Look also, the buccal side of uh, our bony wall is completely gone. The buccal plate is uh, apical to the um, apex of the tooth. This is after one year. Uh, by the way, the tooth was intruded a couple of millimeters, and uh, you know what intrusion means. It means that there is a periodont uh, periodontal ligament here. And this is after five years. Uh, look at the aesthetics. And the thing uh, taking away, pulling away these tooth, and uh, substituting it with an implant, what uh, they meant. And uh, tell me if any of you would, be, na would uh, be able to get a better aesthetic than this in this area. This was the baseline. This is the case after 10 years. And the stability in uh, the radiograph. So we can do a lot. And as you have seen, we can maintain the teeth over time quite stable. And uh, I don't show to you only cases, show to you science. This is our study, 10 year study on 175 subjects with very severe intraboni defects like this one treated with periodontal regeneration. After 10 years, 96% of these teeth are still in the mouth of our patients. This long-term stability has uh, been confirmed today by several other studies from Ascurian, Nicholas, Preth, and others. And we have in preparation now, going to be published, a 20-year study, 20-year follow-up study. All these studies uh, agree on uh, a few very basic issues. Stability, long-term stability of, our, of the teeth of our patients, and including the ones who are regenerated, uh, last on top of uh, very high compliance of patients with the periodontal recall system, very good uh, oral hygiene at home and nose mouth. If uh, we can keep our patient within compliance, good oral hygiene and nose mouth, we get stability over time. Uh, my dear uh, friends, thank you for this uh, 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 evening with you. I, I hope I have uh, shown to you that regeneration is a winning error to save teeth. You should do like this guy here. He's a winner, and uh, he wins uh, for a reason. He trains a lot. Bolt trains a lot. I many times uh, hear my colleagues, my students, saying, hey, this is too difficult for me. I cannot do it. No, you cannot do it if you don't try. And you have to try not one time, you have to try many times, and you have to train, and you have to be instructed, and you have to try to improve. I have been uh, training and improving now since uh, 1982 in periodontal regeneration. So it's many years. 
am doing it very well, but nobody uh, can do it uh, by uh, really uh, trying once or twice and uh, being upset by a failure. A failure will come. If you try hard, uh, you will succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I can open up uh, uh, my podium for answering some of your questions. Thank you so much. Okay. So we have, uh, uh, I am looking for the questions, sorry, uh, trying to understand. Uh, I think a couple of questions have been uh, already answered by my presentation. There is uh, a couple of questions from uh, uh, David uh, Diamond about uh, uh, what materials uh, we are used uh, have been uh, uh, showing to you that uh, in uh, some of the cases have been using uh, barrier alone, some of the cases are melogenins, some of the cases combination, and some of the cases nothing. A second uh, question from the same uh, colleague at what time uh, do you do final reevaluation? David, I believe uh, it's rather clear that uh, final reevaluation. Um, for the short-term outcome is at uh, about uh, 9 to 12 months, let me say, 9 to 12. Uh, there you get um, quite a reliable idea if you have uh, uh, got success or not. Uh, but then uh, don't stop there and uh, have a look also afterwards. Um, um, there is a question from uh, uh, Hala Shaban, how do you treat craters? I do not treat, uh, treat craters with periodontal regeneration. There is no science above that. Personally, uh, Hala, I treat uh, um, craters with resective therapy. Um, type of suture, we have seen it uh, again from uh, Hala again. Um, I, as you have seen, I use uh, pref preferably gore. I use uh, actually 6 and 7 O gore, PTFE. This is uh, for the unique property of this material of uh, being, mm, making us able to refine the tension at best. You need to be perfect in the tension between the two uh, edges of the wound. Um, let me have a look. Uh, how can you, David, again, David, you are back to me. How can you prevent uh, aesthetic papillary collapse? Uh, listen, this is uh, um, not easy to, uh, to discuss uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes. But let me say, you have uh, three different possibilities. One, you have a very supportive defect. You are okay. You have a lot of... Uh, uh, walls of bone, the papilla will stay up. Second possibility, you are missing a papilla, we are missing a bone, bone support, then you have to add in biomaterials, either barriers and or fillers. Third possibility, you are able to preserve the papilla and make the modified mist. So you don't cut the papilla. If you don't cut the papilla, the papilla will stay up, attached to, to the crested teeth and will not collapse. This will be the best way. Um, here, there is a question about uh, ortho. Uh, after, after periodontal regeneration, Guillermo uh, Schinini. Hey, Guillermo. Hi. Uh, how much? Um, how long do, you, do I wait? This is the question. How long do I wait? Personally, I am very conservative, very, very much. I wait uh, 9 to 12 months. If the case is very difficult, like the one I have shown to you lastly, the central incisor is for sure 12 months a year. I know that some of my colleagues do it uh, a little faster, but I, I don't like it. I am very conservative. Um, um, there is another question about, uh, by Harry uh, Petzos. Harry, uh, your question is, do we need a standardized radiological control uh, after performing regenerative periodontal surgery? 
uh, yes and no. I mean, we need to shot uh, a reliable uh, radiograph, intraolar radiographs. Uh, you should have a radiograph uh, more or less in the same position as the baseline one, of course. Uh, in research, we do it with the stents, with the bite blocks. So we, get, we, reposition, we, we reposition the uh, uh, radiograph exactly in the same position uh, as uh, at baseline. So, for example, the study that have, the studies that we showed to you, with radiographic bone measurements are done with the stent, uh, with the buccal block for the radiographs. This make, makes things uh, even more predictable. Um, uh, this is a very important question from uh, Harry Petzos. Harry. You are, you are asking, what are the requirements your patients have to fulfill in regards to plaque and bleeding before you start regenerative periodontal surgery? Sorry for not being able to go in depth, but uh, my patients um, have to be perfectly clean, have to borrow perfect home care, and have to be completely uh, treated from a periodontal standpoint. I want my patients below uh, full mouth plaque score and bleeding score of 15%. Less than 15% residual plaque and less than 15% residual bleeding in the mouth. And very high levels of compliance. If we don't, uh, if I don't get uh, at that point, I don't apply periodontal regeneration. Um, uh, now, Diego Navas, Dr. Cortellini in the first video I saw that you not use a membrane. Did you did it? No. You saw properly. It was only endogen, no barrier. In that case, it was just endogen without barrier. Um, let me go through another from uh, uh, Kaivan Tofik. I hope I have, uh, uh, I have pronounced it uh, well. In most of cases, lesions reach apex of tooth, how did you debride or, uh, the apex because may cause non-vitality of teeth? I answered to it, uh, um, Taiwan, but it's uh, worth to repeat it. When a tooth is vital and uh, we do not instrument the apex, remains vital. When we have to instrument the apex, we do endo treatment before regeneration. Um, let me have another look again. Uh, uh, again from Kaivan, you are back to me. What best type of tooth splinting? Um, when the best the best splinting is a bridge, of course, but we provide a bridge when a bridge has to be done. In uh, the natural teeth, uh, we splint uh, with. Uh, very uh, simple uh, approaches by bonding the teeth with resin and uh, reinforcing with the fibers or metal. If there are already um, fillings, for example, uh, mesiodistal or occlusal, mesioclusal or distoclusal uh, uh, restorations, we can also do intra crown splinting using the boxes. Um, why using a modified mattress suture? Again, Kaivan. Um, the, internal, uh, the internal mattress is mandatory um, in a regenerative therapy. If you want to provide primary intention uh, closure, you have to close with an internal mattress. Uh, when I do not use a barrier underneath, I always use a modified because uh, is able to provide uh, a stability to the two edges of the wound, pressing from top and pressing from bottom. You have a layer of suture under the papilla and a layer of suture on top of the papilla, keeping the two edges together. This is the reason. Then we have uh, uh, Cassandra Tapartan. What about a platter rich plasma for these cases? Listen. Um, I have no experience of uh, platelet-rich plasma 
and uh, I am not applying platelet-rich plasma to my cases. But if you go to literature, there is no good of it. There are no controlled studies showing any benefit uh, of applying uh, uh, this approach for periodontal regeneration. So go to literature and you will find no support. So please do not. Um, this is a very important question. We don't have a lot of time, but Corey Schmidt asking to discuss uh, home maintenance and recall time and maintenance, please. <laughs> uh, I would like to have a, a day to discuss this issue with you, Car uh, Corey. Um, uh, all my patients after surgery are recalled at least uh, three, four times uh, in the four or five weeks after the uh, procedure. We check uh, very carefully, uh, very frequently to the site, clean, debride, uh, provide uh, full mouth prophylaxis to keep the level of uh, contamination very low. Then uh, they go into a three month recall system, very regular one. But they are very motivated. To get into regeneration, they have to show that they are very motivated and they are very good in home cleaning. Otherwise, they don't get in. Um, so, um, the name, somebody is asking, uh, Nata Adelaye is asking uh, the name of the suture that I use. I use uh, uh, polytetrafluoroethylene sutures, and normally gore is gore. Five and uh, sorry, six and seven O. Um, another question from Hala Shaban: How uh, how long can we do X-rays to see the bone fill? I would say if you don't do research, do it after six months, uh, one time, and you s will see some bone, and uh, after a year you will see the final outcome. As you have seen in my presentation, if you shot another one after three, four, five years, you will see even more if the patient is uh, under control. Um, uh, thank you. There is Alfonso Coscarella saying, amazing results, a big hug. Thank you. I, um, I give back my hug to you. Thank you so much. Uh, a question from... Uh, Okay, when uh, do you decide to do RCT to a vital tooth before regenerative therapy? Um, when I have already answered to this, uh, the root canal treatment uh, only if I have uh, a lesion beyond the apex. Um, what is uh, your opinion? Uh, uh, about chlorhexidine mouth rinse uh, for post-op maintenance from uh, Marina Bugatze. Bugatze, Bugatze, sorry Marina. Uh, Marina, I use a lot of chlorhexidine in the post-op. For five weeks, my patients uh, do rinse with 0.12% chlorhexidine three times per day for one minute. And this is, goes on for about five weeks. In the five weeks, uh, they will not uh, brush normally. For a week, they will not brush at all. After a week, they will get uh, a soft toothbrush. They will start uh, brushing with a soft toothbrush in the area of regeneration. We'll go, uh, we'll go on with chlorhexidine. No interdental cleaning. They will restart interdental cleaning uh, more or less about uh, at week uh, four or five. OK. Um, uh, instrument to debride, which instruments are used for debridement from uh, Robert uh, Borgos, uh, combination of uh, curettes and uh, sonic instruments. I do a lot of sonic instrumentation, but I use a lot of curettes. I combine uh, continuously curettes and sonic instruments. Um, there is uh, uh, from George Alcan, thank you for a perfect presentation, really amazing. Thank you, thank you, George. I like also uh, to read uh, to read aloud these uh, compliments, and, and thank you for being here. Um, 
from David Diamond, uh, who is questioning again with these uh, perioendoperiocases, -endo how much uh, real regeneration can be attribu attributed primarily to endo versus perio. Very, very good question, David. Very good question. Listen, uh, we see it because uh, when we have these um, uh, endo or perio endo cases, uh, what we do is to treat the endo part, wait, wait at least uh, three months, then check again. You know, in uh, three months, more or less in three months, you have, uh, uh, you should have, you should see uh, the healing of the endo component of the gene. Uh, if uh, there is no healing uh, of the endo component, that, then it's all perio. Sometimes it improves. This is very important. You have to wait at least uh, three months and reevaluate. And after three months, you, you see the real perio component left. Thank you for the question. It's very important. Um, then we have, uh, uh, okay, I have, uh, again, uh, thanks from Alla Glotva, Yusuf al uh from uh, El Uki Kuti. This is uh, not pronounced well, but uh, thank you, Master, for the amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, there is another question. Uh, with M missed, uh, B perform was in last defect like the ones presented. Uh, the question is, is very important. The question is, uh, can modified mist uh, be uh, applied uh, to very large defects? Uh, listen, very difficult, really very difficult. I'll do it. I am very experienced. I do the modified mist uh, since uh, uh, eight years now. And sometimes I can uh, apply it uh, to very, very severe defects. But uh, this is not easy. Uh, normally, if a defect extends all around, you better rise up uh, a papilla preservation flap with the buckle and the lingual elevation to uh, have a good vision of the, uh, of the root and uh, be able to clean perfectly. Listen, first issue is good cleaning. If you are not able to provide good cleaning, it's completely useless to uh, reduce uh, uh, invasivity. Okay. Um, uh, there is uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Serhat Aslan, uh, that is uh, saying, uh, Ciao Sandro. Ciao Sandro in Italian is, of course, uh, bye bye Sandro. And thank you, uh, Serhat. Bye bye to you. Um, we have, uh, uh, I have uh, again uh, compliments from uh, Rodica, Grigorescu, and Kaivan Tufik. And uh, I think we are done. I mean, I have uh, uh, read through most of your questions. I hope uh, I have answered in, uh, in full. And uh, if not, uh, get in touch. I am here. I'm in Florence. I'm reachable. You go through my website, and uh, you find me. And I am very happy to answer your questions. Again, thank you. Thank you for your attention. And uh, have a good evening. We all go back to our family. Thank you very much, Dr. Cortellini, for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We would also like to thank Batis for making this online course possible and thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The CE quiz is now available online on the course page and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You will receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Further questions for Dr. Cortellini may be submitted directly on the website on the courses page under the Ask the Expert tab. So please go ahead and submit your questions and Dr. Cortellini will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit the Batis educational platform www.batisacademy.com and keep an eye out for our growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all, take care and goodbye.